generated back to you. Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Y'all, please rise. Shake, shake your legs. Get them working again. If you place your hand over your heart, make sure your heart is beating. Any, any caps off, please remove them and begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's the best pledge of allegiance I've heard in years. Some of us are going to go there tomorrow and take that group picture. By the way, make sure you wear your your shirt tomorrow so we can all be together and everybody knows who we are, okay? Tom, would you come and talk to us about the museum? And this man is very, very interesting and he has a lot to say. So please thank you, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, CCK. All right, my name is Don Gray. I've been a volunteer at the museum for pushing uh, 16 plus, I'm close to 17 years with them, so I have some understanding of the place. And uh, what I wanted to share with you is a bit of overview. There's two things that I really want to cover with you. One is, oriented to the museum is only 22 acres. Just a small little place, folks. We are the keeper of your stories. And the more we can do of that, the more we can learn from that and share and put on display, now we have the real human interest to what it is we're able to do. Go ahead. So there it is. Again, it's going to be a little bit hard to see. Some of you have already been over there. Some of you were out there recently. And some people have said, well, I was over there in October. What have you done? Oh, my God. Well, I thank you very much. I hope to see you all tomorrow. Have a great time out there. Our next speaker, I met him in the shower. <laughs> when I first went to CCK, I, I lived on base right next to the Oak Club, and I was in the shower one day, and Rick Wimps walked in, he had a patch on his shoulder, and I said, what the heck, used another word, but what the heck happened to you? He said, I got shot. I'm going, who shoot that is? He said, and he told me the story. I finally found his website. And I called him up and fortunately he remembered me and I remembered him. And we asked him to, to come and talk, talk about a mission that a number of people that are in this room participated in. But uh, Rick was on an airplane that, uh, that got shot up. He's gonna tell you all about it. But it was uh, back in April of 72, 15 April 72. We'd like to have Rick come up and tell us about an airdrop mission at Anlock, South Vietnam. Rick? Thank you. Thank you. Before I begin, um, it's a very humbling honor to be here and to speak to all of you. And I want to say this disclaimer. Our mission was one of many missions that happened from 1963-65 to 1973 that were completed by C-130 air crews from Tachikawa, Naha, Clark, Mactan, and a couple other bases where C-130 crews risked their lives and sometimes pay the ultimate price to get supplies, personnel in or out of different Air Force bases, Army bases, the Marine Corps at Quezon, Quan uh, Duc Duke back in 1967, I think it was, when one crew had an 18-hour crew day to pick up any leftover survivors from the severe mortar attacks in the MVA and the Viet Cong. So this is just one mission, one day in the life of a C-130 aircrew. So that's to give you a picture. So on April 5th, 1972, the People's Army of North Vietnam 
came through Cambodia and invaded Three Corps. And they headed to a town kind of central in Three Corps, about 60 miles north of Saigon, called Anlock. And they surrounded the town on 12 April 1972, and they cut off the supply road, Highway 13. So the only way to get supplies, med medical supplies, food supplies, ammunition, was by airdrop, and guess who got the mission? 374 tactical by airlift wing at a CCK. All right. My spare 617's air crew consisted of the late Captain then, later to retire as a colonel, Bill Buddha Caldwell. The first, the co pilot was first Lieutenant John Herring. I have no idea where John is at this point. He got out and went to fly C 130s for the CIA in 1973 or 74. I was the navigator, the first lieutenant. The flight engineer was Tech Sergeant John Sanders. John was KIA, killed in action. The road masters were the late Staff Sergeant, later Tech Sergeant Charlie Shaw. And A1C, or Airman First Class, David McAleese. And then we had a Vietnamese Air Force load master with us because we were resupplying the 5th uh, Army of Vietnam, or Arvin Division. At the mission briefing, we were told each aircraft would deploy 12 pallets of 105-millimeter howitzer shells to the beleaguered Arvin Division at Anlock using standard CDS drop procedures. And kind of standard for us was three ships, so you got the first ship, 2,000 feet behind to the right, second ship, back to the left, 2,000 feet behind him was the third ship. We'd come at 6,500 feet, drop down to 600 feet, slow down 130 knots, and then each aircraft would go across the VZ and drop in whatever the cargo was. Anlock was, like I said, was 60 miles north of Tatsunu, and so the plan was we would come in from the south, and then egress to the northwest, and then return back to Saigon. So we're out at the flight line, the sun's going down, we're completing our pre-flight checklists, loading the pallets, and I happen to look out, and the aircraft is facing due north, and I see a big, huge Oklahoma-style thunderstorm. Sure enough, that thunderstorm was right over Anlock. So I get a hold of Buddha, and I say, I don't think we're going anywhere tonight. And he says, why? I said, see that thunderstorm? It's right over the drop zone. And sure enough, he makes a call in the command post, and they come back and say, your nav's exactly right, scrub the mission. So we were scheduled for 8 o'clock the next morning. So on 15 April, 1972, which was a Saturday. At about 8.15, all three aircraft took off. But during the briefings, things were changed. We would all take off together, but then we'd go out and we would orbit southeast of Anlock. And we would only go in when a forward air controller told us it was safe, in quotes, to go in. And so the first aircraft goes in, they make their drop, they get one hit in the tail, the vertical stabilizer, and off they go back to Saigon, and that's the end of their day, and they're at the bar. Well, the next aircraft starts in, and as they get through their, their pre-drop checks, the load gets hung up. And so they had to abort the mission, and they go back to Saigon. And so now it's our turn. Well, so we start on our planned thing from 6,000 to 6,500 feet above ground level, and we get down to about 4,000 feet. It's April. Anybody in here tell me what happens in April in Asia? Uh, wrong. They set all the rice patties on fire. And so we get into a smoke layer and we can see absolutely 
nothing on the ground. So we abort our run-in. We go back out, and we aborted it early on. I mean, it wasn't like we got to a, near the drop zone. I mean, we were still 15, 20 miles away. So we go back around, what are we gonna do? I said, we're gonna go down to 1,500 feet, or 1,000 feet, you get below this cloud of haze, and then we're gonna go in and do our drop. Some people blame Buddha Caldwell for making that decision, but actually I was the one that suggested it, Buddha and the rest of the crew concurred with me, because we wanted to get the mission done. And so we get down to 1,500 feet, we can now see, we pick a totally different heading from where the other aircraft had come in, and we start our run in. Um, from heading from the southeast instead of from the south the west we're heading 300 342 degrees which would be about your 11 o'clock position out here to come right across the drop zone into egress so normally a navigator if you look at the c-130 airplane and so i'm flight engineer sitting in the middle on his pedestal the co to the right the aircraft commander is to the left, and my navigator panel is to the right. And normally for the airdrop, I'm over here behind the co-pilot and looking at all my data, you know, and all my gauges and airspeed, ground speed, and all that good stuff, wind direction. But my drop point was a radio antenna over here behind Bill Combo. So I go over here behind Buddha. It's the only reason I'm alive today be quite possibly the only reason Tech Sergeant Sanders is dead. So we're doing our run in, descended down to 600 feet, get the load ready, everything's copacetic as they say, going smoothly. We get to the one minute warning, and I tell the crew when I give the five second warning, don't get antsy because I'm not going to say the magic words but I wasn't allowed to say until it was time. It's called green light, which means release the locks and the load goes out the airplane. So I want that, those pallets, that ammunition on the ground where they belong. And so I'm getting really close to the five second warning and all of a sudden there is this big boosh in the back of the airplane where a 81 or 51 cal shell had gone through the bleed air system and I said crew nav we're taking hits and right after that I said crew nav green light and the next thing I know I'm laying on the floor on my back looking up at the ceiling of the airplane and going to they get to load off and I hear rumble 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 <laughs> okay that's good and then I look up Tech Sergeant Shaw, uh, Sanders is over like this with part of his head missing. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't cause anybody stomach problems. And then I look at the pilots. How many of you have ever seen old, when you were younger, saw old World War II movies or actual films of B-24s and B-17 bombers and where they've taken flak and uh, everything's blown apart and the pilot's still flying with one leg. One leg missing, the co pilot's missing an arm, and they're still flying the airplane on. And so I'm looking at our pilots, the pilot, co pilot, and they're fine. So I said, Well, why am I laying here on the floor? So I start looking at me, and my legs are okay. This is what's funny. I have a hole in my flight suit with some blood around it that's about as big as the fingernail on this finger. That's all. That I know of. He says, well, can you get the co-pilot and pilot's side windows and open them? I said, yeah. So he pulls the hatch just in case we, for two reasons, to get the smoke out. And number two is if we crash land, we can exit out, out of there. And I opened up the co-pilot's windows and within 15 seconds, the smoke's gone. So Charlie goes back in the back to continue trying to put out a fire that was back there and burns his hands. And all of a sudden, I look up and I see two flashing handles for engines one and two, which are fire indications. So Charlie gets back and looks out the, one of the windows at the wing, and I get up behind Buddha and look out and look at the two engines. We don't see any smoke, any fire, but the temperature gauges are going up like this. 
And so we make a decision to shut down engines one and two. And then it occurs to us, we have no hydraulics because we shut down those engines to lower the main landing gear. And so we go through, gear doesn't come down. Okay, let's do it again. Gear doesn't come down. And I'm one of these goofy, in some ways, not in most ways, but in, 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 in flying aircraft, I'm kind of OCD. So I was one of these goofy navigators that had read the whole C-130 tech manual. All of a sudden, something clicked from the back of my mind Look at the Kopas lower circuit breaker panel. And at the bottom, over here by the Kopas, are these two little circuit breakers that say landing gear. Go through this very slowly, and I'll do the flight engineer's parts. And we go through it, and this time, because we went slow, the Kopas comes to and says, flight engineer, pull two circuit breaker panels on the lower propellant's panels. So I get down on my knees, pull them out, we finish the rest of the checklist, and one of the sweetest sounds, other than hearing the cry of one of my four children that were born, and I was there for each one, was the couple look of that landing gear falling into place. And so we go on to Saigon, the Copas flying the airplane, almost looking out, well, for whatever reason, almost has his head out the window that I'd opened. And so we landed safely. We stopped in the middle of the runway, fire engines, ambulances come running out, shuts down that runway for an hour or two. The medics come on board, they grab me and Charlie Shaw, whose hands are burned really bad, throw us in the back of the, the bus, so to speak, and off we go to Saigon. And to this day, there's still a movement going on, especially among load masters, as Chuck Nagy can attest to, that we're still trying to get Charlie a metal bomber, even if it is posthumously. Here's why. That first shell we heard caught a, caused a, a bleed air leak, and it set the bulkhead, at the, okay, right behind the cockpit, on fire. So that also caused the two most forward pallets of the 12 to catch fire. And so uh, it's trying to battle the fire, two pallets go off. These other two pallets also start to roll off and they wedge together. So the VNAF NCO gets one pallet, Charlie gets the other, these pallets are on fire now and they push them off the back of the airplane, and then they go back, lay on the ramp, guys, grab a hold of the end of the ramp, they weren't strapped to anything, and peek over and watch those pallets go, and they exploded 300 feet off the ground. Um, if Charlie hadn't done that, I wouldn't be standing here today. And I always thought that one of the criteria for the Medal of Honor is you save the lives of your comrades, whether it cost you your life or you were fortunate to live too. Now, in the air war, the United States Air Force and Southeast Asia Tactical Airlift, um, they say our pilots never made the drop zone. We were really lousy at what we did, even though we're all shut up and all that. But I know for certain that spare 615s, 12 pallets made the drop zone, or at least somewhere close enough to be recovered. And our 10 pallets made the drop zone. On April 16th, the Army Major, who was advising the Army unit, was wounded in the abdomen and ended up where? Three beds down from me <laughs> at Third Field Hospital. And so on the 17th, Monday, he comes over to me and said, Lieutenant Lance, I said, Sir, he goes, I want to thank you and your crew and offer my condolences for the death of Tech Sergeant Sanders. How he knew who I was, who Tech Sergeant Sanders was, I don't know, but he knew. And he said, I want you to know 
that your pallets, your ammunition and the other air crew's ammunition made the drop zone and we were able to hold off the Viet Cong and the uh, People's Army of North Vietnam and their 234 tanks. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And Rick, thank you for your testimony. Uh, how clear it is to me that the reason why you're sitting there tonight is because God protected you and helped you get down on that landing field. We are here at the museum in Dayton, Ohio. We are currently looking at the C-130 that Rick Lentz flew in that was shot up back in 1972. This, this particular C-130 was at CCK in 1972 and 1973. This is all of the those who attended the or are attending the 2019 CCK reunion. And we're going to ask everybody if they could to wave to all those that are watching this on Facebook. Hi, Mom. All right. And you know what we can say? It's another beautiful day in the ROC. Brother men who fly, we 
the bowl. May I see your bowl here? Yep. Here's one of the bowls that's been prepared. All right, looking good. Thank you. You're welcome. And we're just having a great time here today. And everybody's together from for the reunion. I'm everywhere. I know this is not rehearsed. I do apologize. Now I'm going to kind of take you over and I'm going to let you see them and go in barbecue. Hey guys, will you give me, hey, Hey, can you give me, I'm, I'm live streaming, can you show me how you do it? All right, give me a show, would you? All right, all right, there we go. All right. Okay, man. Hey, these guys really know how to do it, I tell you. All right. We're just having a great time. All right. Everybody all right, can I see you? <laughs> All right. Well, of course, we're coming over here. I know it's kind of chaotic, but you know how restaurants are. And there's a, a family here that's uh, uh, enjoying and getting ready to order things. All right. So tell us what you're going to order tonight. Uh, what's your thought? Uh, what are you going to order, sir? Barbecue. Yeah. All right, we're going barbecue. All right, how about you, sir? I have no idea. All right.
color. Halt. Present. Harps. And if you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please take your seats. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out to see us. Um, I'm Dave Hoffman. I'm the talking to us the other day, there were a number of uh, folks during the Vietnam conflict that lost their lives that we were probably knowledgeable of, but there was 58,000, and I'm not sure the exact number, but a lot. And unfortunately, but this table represents those folks that are not here that would have loved to be here. Hey, one thing I want to say, though, before I, I get started, I'm going to ask Jim to stand up one more time, and I want to give him a hand as well. I think he's a trendsetter, you know, because look what he's wearing tonight. Right? I want to get I want to get across tonight, or during the three days, the idea that I have finally, you have finally, been welcomed home, and I want to say, welcome home, GI. Yeah. Hey, you see these people? All right. Hey, thank you. Good one. The one in white? The one in white, because I work trance and alert. Oh. Uh, if, I, if I hit right on base and didn't say so, they'd call me to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for your service. Thank you all for your service. All right, so I'm going to give it back over to Jim. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Jim. So who got there in 65? He's a navigator. 65? Yeah. Come on up. Come on up. 65. Woo! Tell me, what month in 65? In July. July of 65. You know, we, we talked about our wives. The wives were a special part of every base we were at, every mission we flew. But that was it. Nobody really recognized them per se. My last promotion, I told my wife, this would have happened to me. She wasn't there. And thank you, sweetheart, for always being there for me. 
Okay. From the, from the bottom of my heart, Bob's going to tell you too. From the bottom of my heart, I appreciate each one of you taking the time, spending it with us, and it's been a great pleasure to hold this reunion. Thank you, safe journey. God bless y'all. Appreciate you coming. When I fly that plane 